Well, are you ready to get into Yah's Word today? I am as well. I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 41. And we're going to begin with verse 1 in just a moment. And we're tracking along with this week's Torah portion. And the Torah portion is entitled, At the End. That phrase comes out of the first verse of the Torah portion. And we'll be reading that in just a moment. I've entitled this message today, Torah Truths About Household Salvation. Now, there are a lot of things that I could preach out of this Torah portion, but the thing that really stuck out for me in this reading was the fact that Yah took a young man of 17 years old and postured him through a lot of trials and hardships and difficulties to be in the right place at the right time to be able to bring household salvation to his loved ones, to his father and his brothers and all their households. And so that really struck me because I have seen in the scripture a thread of household salvation that goes through the entire Bible. And it is something that we can believe for. I believe that Yah does take people and give them revelation and put them out in front of their families. And oftentimes it's through trials and tribulations and difficulties and hardships to be postured to be able to bring truth to their family and bring a salvation to their household. And so that's what today's message is all about. Let's pick up with Genesis chapter 41, beginning with verse 1. It says, And it came to be at the end of two years' time that Pharaoh had a dream and saw him standing by the river and saw seven cows coming up out of the river, beautiful looking and fat, and they fed amongst the reeds. Then saw seven other cows coming up after them out of the river, ugly and lean of flesh, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and lean of flesh cows ate up the seven beautiful looking and fat cows, then Pharaoh awoke, and he slept and dreamed a second time and saw seven heads of grain coming up on one stalk, plump and good, and saw seven lean heads scorched by the east wind coming up after them, and the seven lean heads swallowed the seven plump and complete heads. Then Pharaoh awoke and saw it was a dream." And so Pharaoh had these two dreams, and these two dreams pictured one event that was to take place in the future. And Pharaoh was concerned about these dreams. He wanted to know the meaning of the dreams. So he called the magicians, and he called the wise men of Mitzrayim, of Egypt, together. And he told them about the dreams, and they could not bring the interpretation. But then... The cupbearer of the sovereign that had an encounter with Yosef while Yosef was in the prison. The cupbearer was there as well. And he had a dream, and Yosef was able to interpret his dream. And he remembered Yosef. And he told Pharaoh about this young Hebrew man who had the ability to interpret dreams. And so Pharaoh called Yosef out of the prison and he came before Pharaoh and Pharaoh told him the dreams and Yosef, through the help of Elohim, was able to interpret his dreams. So let's pick up with Genesis chapter 41 and verse 25. And Yosef said to Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. Elohim has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years and the seven good heads are seven years. It is one dream. And the seven lean and ugly cows which came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty heads scorched by the east wind are seven years of scarcity of food or famine. Verse 28. This is the word which I spoke to Pharaoh. Elohim has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. See, seven years of great plenty are coming in all the land of Mitzrayim. 
verse 30, but after them seven years of scarcity of food shall arise and all the plenty be forgotten in the land of Mitzrayim. And the scarcity of food shall destroy the land and the plenty shall not be remembered in the land because of the scarcity of food following. For it is very severe. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the word is established by Elohim and Elohim is hastening to do it. Now the Torah says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established. And Pharaoh had two dreams, two witnesses. So we see in verse 33 of Genesis 41 that Yosef is then exalted by the sovereign of Mitzrayim to the second position in the land. It says, and now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man. So this is Yosef speaking to Pharaoh. And set him over the land of Mitzrayim. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint overseers over the land to take up one fifth of the land of Mitzrayim in the seven years of plenty. Verse 35, and let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities and the food shall be for a store, store it up for the land for the seven years of scarcity of food, which shall be in the land of Mitzrayim. And do not let the land be cut off by the scarcity of food. In other words, do this and be prepared. Verse 37, And the word was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Could we find another like him, a man in whom is the spirit of Elohim? Then Pharaoh said to Yosef, Since Elohim has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. So this is Elohim posturing Yosef. He's putting him where he wants him to be so that he can bring about this great deliverance, this great salvation for all the people of Mitzrayim and the surrounding areas, but especially for the house of Israel. Verse 40, be over my house. This is Pharaoh speaking. You yourself and at your mouth, all my people shall kiss. Only in the throne I am greater than you. So there will only be one greater than Yosef in all the land, and that's Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Yosef, See, I have set you over all the land of Mitzrayim. And Pharaoh took his seal ring off his hand and put it on Yosef's hand. In other words, whenever Yosef says a matter, gives a decree, he can seal it as if Pharaoh himself sealed it. And he dressed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried out before him, bow the knee. And he set him over all the land of Mitzrayim. And Pharaoh said to Yosef, I am Pharaoh and without a word from you, let no man lift his hand or foot in all the land of Mitzrayim. So this is the working of Elohim. This is the posturing of Elohim, of this young man to be in a place where Yah can use him to bring about a great deliverance and a great salvation for the house of Israel and all the people of Mitzrayim and the surrounding areas. Then look at Genesis Chapter 41 and verse 46, it says this. Now, Yosef was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, sovereign of Mitzrayim. And Yosef went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Mitzrayim. So his trial, his hardships started when he was 17 years old. And he was exalted when he was 30. And so he had 13 years of trial and difficulty and people lying about him and falsely accusing him and forgetting him in the prison. 13 years of hardship, 13 years where I'm sure he could have wondered what Elohim was up to. He could have wished 
that he was in a different situation. We know he wanted out of the prison. He told the chief cupbearer, remember me to Pharaoh, get me out of this prison. And he had to wait another two years after that. And so he had patience and he was being trained. Just think about it. He was in the house of Potiphar and he managed Potiphar's house. And that was training him to be able to manage all of the land of Mitzrayim. And he learned patience in the prison. He was being perfected for the job that Yah had for him in the future. And in essence, that's what trials will do in our lives if we allow them. We can learn patience. We can receive favor from Yah in the midst of our trial, in the midst of our trouble. We can grow, we can mature, we can be prepared for what He has for us in the future. Because I believe He doesn't waste any experience. That He wants us to learn and mature and grow through all that we go through. Because He has something marvelous for us in the future. He wants to use us in a special way in the future. And He will prepare us through the trials that we go through. So 13 years, have you thought about that? Can you endure your situation for 13 years? 13 years later, Yosef is exalted to the second position of all of Mitzrayim. He is exalted to the second position in all of Mitzrayim. And he's ready to bring about this great salvation of Yah. All right, let's look at verse 47. And this tells us that Yosef stored up grain in the seven years of plenty to be prepared for the seven years of famine. It says, And in the seven years of plenty, the ground brought forth generously, and he gathered all the food of the seven years, which were in the land of Mitzrayim, and laid up the food in the cities. So he stored up the food in all the cities. He laid up in every city the food of the fields which surrounded them. Thus Yosef gathered very much grain, as the sand of the sea, until he ceased counting, for it was without number. So there were seven years of great plenty, and he stored up the grain to prepare for the seven years of famine. And he was ready. He was ready for those years of famine. And it's interesting, we read about the names of his sons that were born to him in Mitzrayim, in Egypt. And their names really tell his story. So I wanted to include them in this message today. And let's look at verse 50 of Genesis chapter 41. It says, And to Yosef were born two sons before the years of scarcity of food came, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, bore to him. And Yosef called the name of the firstborn, Manasseh, for Elohim has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. In other words, he was saying the plan, the strategy of Elohim is so great and I'm beginning to see it. It's beginning to manifest around about me. And because it's so wonderful, I have forgotten all the years of trial, the 13 years of hardship. He's made me forget that. And he's also made me forget the pain that my brothers caused me in my father's house. And the fact that I didn't get to see my father's face for 13 years. So Elohim, because of the greatness of his strategy, because of the greatness of his plan, is executing this plan in such a marvelous way that it's causing Yosef to forget his toil, his hardship, and to forget the pain that his brothers caused him. And then look at verse 52. And the name of the second, speaking of the second son born to him, he called Ephraim. For Elohim has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Now that's something that we can all learn from. There is no difficulty. There's no hardship. There's no trial that any of us can face that is too great, that we cannot be fruitful and learn and mature and grow and develop 
in the land of our affliction. Ephraim means Elohim has caused me to be fruitful. Fruitful in the land of my affliction. In other words, he worked through me. He's worked all things in my life, in the land of my affliction, together for my good. He's matured me. He's given me a deep and great perspective on things. He's caused me to be a person of greater prayer. He's developed trust within me. There's all sorts of things that Yah wants to do in us through our affliction. We just have to be willing to allow Him to work in us when we're in those difficult times. And that can be a challenge. But no, He can do anything but fail. And He will produce fruitfulness in your life as you trust Him, even in the midst of your trial. And then we see in Genesis chapter 41, beginning with verse 56, Yosef sold grain to all the people of Mitzrayim and the surrounding areas that came to him during the time of scarcity of food. It says, And the scarcity of food was over all the face of the earth. And Yosef opened all the storehouses and sold to the Mitzrites. And the scarcity of food was severe in the land of Mitzrayim. And all the earth came to Yosef in Mitzrayim to buy grain because the scarcity of food was severe in all the earth. And so he began to function in this capacity, in this strategy of Elohim to be a savior of sorts to the people of Mitzrayim and all the surrounding areas because he received revelation and he was operating within that revelation. And he prepared for the famine as Elohim told him to. He used the wisdom provided by Elohim to be prepared. And so now he's functioning in this, in this calling that Elohim has given him. And we see that Yosef's brothers then come to Mitzrayim to buy grain. Let's look at Genesis chapter 42 beginning with verse 1. And when Yaakov saw that there was grain in Mitzrayim, Yaakov said to his sons, now this is Yaakov, this is Yosef's father. His name was changed to Israel. Why do you look at each other? In other words, why are you standing there looking at each other? We have a problem on our hands here. We need a solution. And he said, see, I have heard that there is grain in Mitzrayim. Isn't it interesting? He uses difficult times to get Yosef's family's attention. And he'll do the same in your life as well. There will come a time when your family will need the wisdom and the understanding that you have. And they will desire the truth that you've received. And so just understand that dynamic. Go down, verse 2, to that place and buy for us there and let us live and not die. So this is Jacob speaking to his sons. Go down to Mitzrayim, to Egypt, and buy grain, and let us live and not die. So it was a life or death situation. And Yosef's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Mitzrayim. But Jacob did not send Yosef's brother, Benjamin, with his brothers. For he said, lest some harm come to him. And the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed, for the scarcity of food was in the land of Canaan. Verse 6, And Yosef was the governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Yosef's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. And that's exactly what his dreams showed him when he was 17 years old. When he was 17 years old, he had those dreams where his brothers would bow before him. And now we see that these dreams are coming to pass. Verse 7, And Yosef saw his brothers and recognized them, but he acted as a stranger to them and spoke to them harshly and said to them, Where do you come from? And they said, From the land of Kenaan to buy food. So Yosef recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. 
And Yosef remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them and said to them, you are spies. So he remembered. It had been a long time, but he remembered those dreams. And he was thinking, this is coming to pass just the way Yah showed me. And he said, you're spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, no, my master, but your servants have come to buy food. We're just here to buy food. We're not spies. We are all one man's sons. We are trustworthy. Your servants are not spies. But he said to them, no, but you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said, your servants are 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And see, the youngest is with our father today, that's Benjamin, and one is no more. They're speaking of Yosef, but he's standing there before them and they don't realize it. And Yosef said to them, it is as I spoke to you saying, you are spies. So he's kind of roughing them up a little bit. Verse 15, by this you shall be proven by the life of Pharaoh. You do not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. So he wants to see his brother, Benjamin. Verse 16, send one of you and let him bring your brother while you are kept in prison. In other words, I'm going to keep you all in prison. One of you is to go to the land of Canaan and bring your youngest brother here to me. So let your words be proven to see whether there is any truth in you. Are you telling the truth? Or else, by the life of Pharaoh, you are spies. If you don't bring me your youngest brother to prove that you're telling the truth, then you are spies. And he put them all together in prison for three days. He let them sweat it out for three days. Now, Yosef said to them the third day. Now, this is after Yosef had time to think about it, had time to pray, had time to hear from Elohim. Do this and live, for I fear Elohim. If you are trustworthy, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house, and you, the rest of you, go bring grain for the scarcity of food of your houses. So now he's thinking about his brother's households. He's thinking about his father. He doesn't want them to starve. And so he's saying, one of you will stay, the rest of you will go and take food to my father, Israel, and to your households. Verse 20, and bring your youngest brother to me and let your words be confirmed and you do not lie. And so they did. And they said to each other, truly, we are guilty concerning our brother. So now they're being convicted. They realize they did the wrong thing. They don't know they're talking to their brother, but they say, truly, we are guilty concerning our brother. In other words, this hardship is coming upon us because of our guilt, because of our sins. For we saw the distress of his life when he pleaded with us, yet we did not listen. He was pleading with them not to throw him into that pit, not to sell him into slavery. And they would not listen to him because they hated him. They hated him because he had received revelation from Elohim. He had those dreams and he shared those dreams with them. They hated him because he had a deep relationship with his father. They hated him because his father, Israel, had made a long robe for him that caused him to stand out. They wanted to kill him. But then they thought, well, we won't get any money if we just kill him. We'll just sell him. And that's what they did. Now that this trouble has come upon them, they're feeling guilty. They're saying we are guilty because we saw his distress and he pleaded with us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us, they said. And Rehu Ben answered them saying, did I not speak to you saying, do not sin against the boy? And he did. He's the one who pleaded with them not to kill him. 
And while Rehoboam was away, they sold him. And so he's true when he said, did I not speak to you saying, do not sin against the boy? And you would not listen. And see, his blood is now required of us. So they think he's dead. They don't know they're talking to him. And now they believe they have blood guilt. That his blood is now required of them. And that Elohim is punishing them for what they did to him. Because they believe by selling him, that led to his death. Verse 23, and they did not know that Yosef understood them. They're speaking in Hebrew. And Yosef is speaking to them through an interpreter. So they didn't know that Yosef understood what they were saying. It says, for he spoke to them through an interpreter. Verse 24, and he turned himself away from them and wept, but came back to them and spoke to them. And he took Shimon from them and bound him before their eyes. He wanted them to see what it was like to be bound up because he had been bound and carried off to Mitzrayim. And Yosef commanded, and they filled their sacks with grain, also to put back every man's silver to his sack. So Yosef commanded that their sacks be filled with grain. He also told his servants to give them their silver back and to give them food for the journey. And thus it was done for them. So they loaded their donkeys with the grain and went from there. So they go back to the land of Canaan. They tell their father, Israel, what happened. They tell their father about this governor in the land who was somewhat harsh to them and called them spies and threw them in prison for three days and took Shimon and bound him up and then sent them back to get their youngest brother, Benjamin. And this breaks the heart of Israel because Israel doesn't want Benjamin to go to Mizraim. He doesn't want to lose Benjamin. So he's hesitant. And for quite some time, he will not allow his youngest son to go. And we pick up the story here in Genesis chapter 43 and verse 1, which tells us that Yosef's brothers do finally return to Mitzrayim for food. It says, but the scarcity of food was severe in the land. And it came to be when they had eaten up the grain, which they had brought from Mitzrayim, they ate everything. There wasn't anything left that their father said to them, go back, buy us a little food. You're going to have to go back. You're going to have to get us more food. But Yehuda spoke to him saying, the man vehemently warned us saying, you do not see my face unless your brother is with you. Don't come back here unless you bring your youngest brother. If you let our brother go with us, we go down and buy you food. We're only going to go buy food if you let Benjamin go with us. But if you do not let him go, we do not go down. Because the man said to us, you do not see my face unless your brother is with you. I mean, they're serious about this. They... They were terrified of what could have happened to them when they were there in Mitzrayim at the hands of this governor. And they're saying, we're not going back there unless we take Benjamin with us, as this governor said to us. Verse 6, And Israel said, Why did you do evil to me to inform the man that you still had another brother? Why did you tell him that? And they said, the man kept asking us about our relatives, saying, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? See, Yosef loves his family. And it really didn't matter that they put him through such hardship. He still loves his family. And I think about many of us who are on this journey of belief in Yeshua and a desire to follow him in the Torah lifestyle. And the fact that when you start walking in the Torah lifestyle, oftentimes you are rejected by your family. You're ostracized. You're isolated. You're pushed out. You're not included. And there can be a lot of pain there. But we still love our families. 
And that's what this message is all about. Because Abiyah has a plan for every person that he gives a revelation to. He sends you out before your family to prepare the way, to be there with an understanding of truth so that when the family members get to a place where they desire truth, they're interested in coming to know what you know, what Yah has given you. Then you're there and you're postured and you can share that truth and you can help in this journey. And so Yosef loved his family. He still loved his brothers, even though they had done great harm to him. And so he's asking, is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? And we informed him according to these words. How could we know that he would say, bring your brother down? How would we know that? And Yehudah said to Israel, his father, Send the boy with me and let us arise and go and live and not die. This is a life or death situation. You're going to have to send the boy. Send him with me, both we and you and also our little ones. In other words, this is a grave situation. All of us are in this situation together. Verse 9, I myself shall stand guarantee for him. From my hand, you are to require it. I'll be responsible, in other words. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. I'll take the blame if I don't return him to you. For if we had not delayed, truly by now we could have returned this second time. So he's really reasoning here with Israel. And their father Israel said to them, if so, then do this. In other words, if you're going to do this, then you need to follow my instructions. Take some of the best fruit of the land in your vessels and bring a present down for the man. Well, I tell you what, Yaakov knew about presents. He sent wave after wave after wave of presents to his brother Esau to try to appease him to gain favor. So now he's doing the same thing here. He's sending presents to this governor in Mitzrayim. It says a little balm and a little honey, spices and myrrh, nuts and almonds. And take double silver in your hand. And take back in your hand the silver that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. It could have been a mistake. And take your brother and arise, go back to the man. So it had gotten so dire, they had run out of food, that he's finally willing to allow them to take Benjamin and go back to Mitzrayim. Verse 14, And El Shaddai give you compassion before the man. So he's praying already. So that he shall release your other brother, Shimon, and Benjamin. And I, if I am bereaved, I am bereaved. And the men took that present and Benjamin, and they took double the amount of silver in their hand and arose and went down to Mitzrayim and stood before Yosef. And Yosef saw Benjamin with them and said to the one over his house, bring the men home. In other words, bring them to my house and make a great slaughter. We're going to have a great feast and prepare for these men are to eat with me at noon. So they're going to have a, a great feast at noon. And then we see in verse 26 of chapter 43, that Yosef comes home and there are some interesting things that follow here. And when Yosef came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand. So they're giving him the present into the house and bowed down before him to the earth. Again, fulfilling those dreams that he had when he was 17 years old. And he asked them about their welfare. How are you doing? How are your family members? And said, is your father well? The old man of whom you spoke. He wants to know about his father. Is he still alive? He loves his father. And they said, your servant, our father, is in good health. That was a good report. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads down and did obeisance. And he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son. They were brothers by the same mother. 
and said, Is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, Elohim, show favor to you, my son. And Yosef hurried, for his emotions were deeply moved towards his brother. And he looked for a place to weep. And he went into his room and wept there. He was so moved with emotion to see his younger brother. Then he washed his face and came out and controlled himself and said, serve the food. And they set him a place by himself. So Yosef sat by himself. And then by themselves, so all his brothers sat in another place by themselves, and the Mitzrites who ate with them by themselves, and all of the Mitzrites, the Egyptians, sat in another place. For the Mitzrites could not eat food with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination to the Mitzrites. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at each other in astonishment. In other words, Yosef had them take their seats according to their age. The oldest brother, according to his birthright, first, and then each one according to his age, all the way to the youngest. Which they were amazed at that. I, I can't imagine what was going through their heads about that. How did this man know the birth order? Hmm. Verse 34, And he took portions to them from before him, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. And they feasted and they drank with him. So you can continue to read in this Torah portion. Uh, and as you do, you'll see that there's a bit more back and forth between Yosef and his brothers. But Yosef finally reveals himself to his brothers in Genesis chapter 45, beginning with verse 1. And it says this, And Yosef was unable to restrain himself before all those who stood by him. And he called out, Have everyone go out from me. He's talking about the, the Mitzrites. All of the Egyptians need to leave. Everybody get out of here. So no one stood with him while Yosef made himself known to his brothers. So now he's just there with his brothers alone. He's making himself known. He's revealing himself to his brothers. And he wept aloud. And the Mitzrites and the house of Pharaoh heard it. I mean, this was some, some tremendous weeping and mourning. So much pain being released. So much joy to see his younger brother. So much joy to hear that his father, Israel, was still alive. The hurt the pain was being released and washed with his tears. Look at verse 3. And Yosef said to his brothers, I am Yosef. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were unable to answer him, for they trembled before him. They were trying to figure out what was going on here. This man just said he was Yosef, our brother. He's asking about our father, Israel. He put us in perfect birth order. Could it be that this is Yosef? Could it be that his dreams were true when he was 17 years old? We've been bowing ourselves to him all this time. Could it be that Elohim has postured him, has sent him before us? to put him in a position in the right place at the right time, to be there ready when the circumstances warrant it for us to have need to come to Mitzrayim, to come to Egypt? Is it that we've been bowing down to our brother who is providing a great deliverance for us and bringing us into a place of household salvation? They were trembling before him. Then Yosef said to his brothers, please come near to me. When they came near, he said, I am Yosef, your brother, whom you sold into Mitzrayim. And now do not be grieved nor displeased with yourselves because you sold me here. Now, 
There's no way they couldn't be grieved or displeased with themselves, but this is Yosef bringing forth a deeper, greater dynamic. He says, for Elohim sent me before you to preserve life. So now he knows that Elohim sent him ahead of the family, that Elohim gave him revelation that no one else in the family had, that Elohim revealed truth to him and postured him in that place so that at this moment, he could bring about this great deliverance and save his family from the famine. He says, Elohim sent me before you to preserve life. Well, I believe that Elohim has done that for you. He's placed you out ahead of your family. He's given you revelation. He's opened up the word of truth to you. He's prepared you for that moment when Elohim causes circumstances to take place to bring your family to you so that you can share the truth with them and bring about a great household salvation. Verse 6, For two years now, the scarcity of food has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there is neither plowing nor harvesting. And Elohim sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth. I've been sent ahead of you to prepare for you and to give life to you by a great escape, a great deliverance. So I've been sent ahead of my family to prepare and to bring a great deliverance when the time is right. So then, you did not send me here. You didn't send me here. You thought you were just selling me into slavery. But you didn't send me here. But Elohim, and he has sent me for a father to Pharaoh. In other words, he's made me like a father to Pharaoh and master of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Mitzrayim. Look what Elohim has done. You meant it for evil, but Elohim has turned it around for good. Look what he's done. Hallelujah. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son, Yosef, Elohim has made me master of all Mitzrayim. Come down to me. Do not delay. So go back. Tell Israel, your son Yosef is master in Mitzrayim. Come down. Do not delay. And you shall dwell in the land of Goshen and be near me. You and your children your children's children, your flocks and your herds and all that you have. Keep that in mind if you've been ostracized by your family. Keep that in mind if you've been isolated. Keep that in mind if your family hasn't had much to do with you since you have believed in Yeshua and his Torah lifestyle and you've been following him as he commanded you to do. You're actually walking in the truth of the Torah. You're obeying the commandments and they're not having anything to do with you at this time? Keep this story in mind because this will encourage you. Because at the right time, Yosef was able to bring his family in and to be near to him and to be close to the children and the children's children and the flocks and the herds. Verse 11, And I shall provide for you there in the land of Goshen, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty because five years of scarcity of food are still to come. So he understood what his purpose was. He was to save them from this great famine, but he was going to bring them to Mitzrayim, to Egypt, bring them close to him, them, their children, their, their children's children, their flocks, their herds, and the like. He's going to save them from this great famine. There's five more years of it. And look, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. In other words, I truly am Yosef. You see it and my brother Benjamin sees it. So go back and tell your father Israel. Verse 13. And you shall inform my father of all my esteem in Mitzrayim and of all that you have seen 
You shall hurry and bring my father down here. And he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. And he kissed all his brothers. He loves his brothers. And he wept over them. And after that, his brothers spoke with him. And let's look at verse 24 of Genesis chapter 45. It says, so he sent his brothers away and they left. And he said to them, do not quarrel along the way. Verse 25. And they went up out of Mitzrayim and came to the land of Kinaan to Yaakov, their father. And they told him, saying, Yosef is still alive. I'm sure that was a shock. And he is governor of over all the land of Mitzrayim. Now it's interesting because when he was 17 years old and he told his father the dream about the sun and the moon bowing down to him, the scripture says that even though Israel rebuked him for the dream, he kept it in his heart. He thought about it. And Yaakov knew a little bit about dreams because he had that dream of that great ladder that was set up from the earth, its top reaching the heavens and the messengers of Yah ascending and descending upon that ladder. So he was serious about understanding dreams. It says, And Yaakov's heart ceased when he heard this news, for he did not believe them. It was actually so wonderful. It was hard to believe. But when they spoke to him all the words which Yosef had spoken to them, and when he saw the wagons which Yosef had sent to transport him, the spirit of Yaakov, their father, revived. And Israel said, enough. My son Yosef is still alive. I believe he's still alive. Let me go and see him before I die. What a powerful, powerful message to all of us who have believed upon Yeshua, and have desired to walk in Yeshua's ways. Yeshua said, follow me. And he lived the Torah lifestyle. And we have begun to walk in the commandments. And our hope was that our family would be excited about the truth that we've come to. And yet, like Yosef, we were despised in some regard. Uh, we were ostracized. We were pushed out. We were not accepted by the family. And in the case of Yosef in the house of Potiphar, his wife, Potiphar's wife, tried to get Yosef to lay with her. He wouldn't do it. And so she lied about him. She slandered him. She falsely accused him. And these are all things that happen to people who want to walk in the footsteps of Yeshua. And she told her husband that this Hebrew came in to mock her. And she made up this story. And it angered Potiphar. And he threw Yosef in prison. And Yosef was there in the prison for so many years. And even after he interpreted the dreams of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker perfectly. The chief baker was executed, but he told the chief cupbearer, remember me to Pharaoh so I can get out of this prison. He had to wait two more years. So he had to be patient for another two years, waiting on the right timing of Elohim. And ultimately, as we have told the story, he's brought out of the prison and he was made second in the land. So many of these things have happened to you. The pain, the sorrow, the difficulty, the trial. Some people have spoken evilly against you. Some people have falsely accused you. You've been in a situation where you've been waiting a long time. You're learning patience. This story is so marvelous because it encourages us to stay faithful, to not give up, to not give out, to not give in, but to continue walking 
in the path that's been set before us by Elohim to continue being an example to our family and to our friends and those around about us because we have a promise in Scripture, a promise of household salvation. As I mentioned before, there's a thread of household salvation that runs throughout the entire Bible. I'm going to give you just a, a few of the things here that I've seen in Scripture. The righteousness of Noah, his righteous obedience in building the ark brought salvation to his entire household. Think about that. The righteous obedience of Lot brought salvation to his wife and his two daughters, though his wife turned back to Sodom and lost her salvation, turning into a pillar of salt. Rahav, the harlot, her righteous act of hiding the spies brought salvation to her entire household when she placed that scarlet cord in the window of her house in Jericho. And then the sovereignness, Esther, her righteous act of going before the sovereign on behalf of her people brought salvation to her uncle Mordecai and to all the Jewish people. And then the prayers and the giving of Cornelius, the centurion, brought salvation to all his family. And then Shaul told the Philippian jailer that if he would believe upon Yeshua, he would be saved and his entire household. And as we've already mentioned, Yosef spent 13 years in hardship. And that 13 years of hardship and posturing by Elohim, brought about the salvation of all of Israel's house. I want to leave you with just a, a few more verses as I am laboring to encourage you not to give up, not to give out, not to give in, not to quit, not to turn back, not to let loose of the plow and go back to your old ways. You have been brought into the kingdom for such a time as this. You have been sent before your family. You've been sent before your friends and those who know you with revelation and with truth to prepare the way so that at the right time, you will be there to be able to assist them in a great deliverance. You might say household salvation. I want to take you over to Hebrews chapter 2, and we'll look at verse 10. And this verse is going to tell us that Yeshua, our Mashiach, was perfected by the things that he suffered in his life. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10, it says, For it was fitting for him, because of whom all are, and through whom all are, in bringing many sons to esteem, to make the prince of their deliverance, perfect through sufferings. This is speaking of Elohim. Elohim perfected Yeshua, the prince of our deliverance, through what he suffered. That was the means, that was the method, the strategy of Elohim to perfect Yeshua through his suffering. And if Elohim perfected Yeshua through suffering, will he not perfect all of us through suffering? And so, again, I want to emphasize the fact that if you're going through suffering, you need to realize that you can be fruitful. In other words, you can be called Ephraim. You can be fruitful in the land of your affliction. Don't just say, oh, I'm suffering so much. This is a horrible time. There's nothing good coming out of this. I would do anything to get out of this. I can't see the hand of Elohim in this at all. But realize that He is perfecting you through what you're suffering. That He has a plan to mature you, to cause you to grow, to prepare you, to be ready for what He has for you in the days ahead. You're going to have to go through some hardship. We see that in the Torah. We see that Yosef went through great hardship. 
He was hated by his brothers. They wanted to kill him. They threw him into a pit. Then they sold him into slavery. He went off to Potiphar's house. He was falsely accused. He was lied about. He was slandered. He was thrown into prison. So he went from the pit to the prison. He was in the prison for many years. He had to learn patience and wait for the right timing. Finally, he was brought out and brought to the palace. So he went from the pit to the prison to the palace. And he was like Ephraim. He was fruitful in the land of his affliction. And I want to encourage you to be fruitful in the land of your affliction. Because he is making you. He's preparing you. And there is something great he wants you to do. And I believe that you love your family just like Yosef did. And he wants to see all of your family come to a place of understanding the truth and walking in the truth of his word. And then we can't leave this message without talking about Romans chapter 8, verse 28. This is such a wonderful and encouraging verse. It says, and we know, this is something you can know, you can be confident of, that all matters, all things, work together for good to those who love Elohim. If you love Elohim, He's able to take all matters, not just good matters. You don't have to work good matters together for good. They're already good. But he takes the good things and he takes the hard things and the difficult things and the bad things and he works it all together like a great symphony conductor bringing all of the instruments together for a beautiful symphony. And we know that all matters work together for good to those who love Elohim, to those who are called according to His purpose. And you can be in the land of affliction right now and be called according to His purpose. He will bring you out at the right time. But you have to know that He is orchestrating all things. He's going to bring you into that place where He can use you to bring to pass a great deliverance and a mighty salvation for those whom you love, those in your family, and those round about you. So he's working all things, all matters together for good. And then we're going to leave you with two verses. This is the teaching of Yeshua in Matthew chapter 5, and verse 14. Yeshua said, You are the light of the world. What is the light? Of the world. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 23 says, For the command is a lamp, and the Torah a light. So you are the example of the Torah in the world. Your obedience is a light to the world. The world can see your obedience to the scripture, see your obedience to the Torah, and receive light. In other words, an example. Know what to do. For you are the light of the world. It is impossible for a city to be hidden on a mountain. When you put a city up on a mountain, it's impossible for that city to be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand up high. And it shines to all those in the house. Your life of Torah obedience is like a lamp on a lampstand that shines to everyone in your house. This gets back to household salvation. You've been sent before your family members. What you say, what you do, how you live. This is light to your family. And it's within Yah's will. Sure, you may go through some hardships and some difficulties and people may say evil things against you and people may do things against you that hurt you, just like Yosef's life. But you've been sent as light, as an example of Torah obedience for all those who are in your house. Verse 16, let your light so shine before men so that they see your good works. What are good works? Good works are defined by Torah. When you obey the Torah, when you obey the scripture, then you're performing good works. You don't get to define good works. I don't get to define good works. Good works are defined by Torah. When we obey the Torah, we are performing good works. 
Yeshua said, let your light so shine before men so that they see your good works, your Torah obedience. And they praise your Father who is in the heavens. In other words, there's a transformation that goes on in them through your example, through the light of Torah that you're shining through your life. And they want to praise your Father who is in the heavens. He goes on to say, do not think that I came to destroy the Torah of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to complete or to fulfill or to fill them up to their deeper spiritual application. For truly, I say to you, till the heaven and the earth pass away, the heaven and the earth are the witnesses of Torah. One yod, that's the smallest of the Hebrew letters, or one tittle, a tittle is the little decorative stroke on the Hebrew letters shall by no means pass from the Torah till all be done, till everything in the Torah is accomplished. And there's some things in the Torah that have not yet been accomplished. Whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches men so shall be called least in the reign of the heavens. Again, you have this wonderful responsibility as one who has received revelation to be a teacher of the Torah and so it says here, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands, the Torah commands, and teaches men so shall be called least in the reign of the heavens. But whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the reign of the heavens. So this message is just one of encouragement for you. So many people get so down and discouraged and they feel like they want to quit and they just can't take it anymore that they're ostracized and they're pushed away and their family doesn't have anything to do with them and people say evil against them. They want to give up. And this message is to show you that right from the story of Yosef, Yah has a plan for your life. You were chosen specifically to be given truth and revelation and you went out before your family. Yes, you've had to endure hardship and difficulty, but you're being made in that time. You're being perfected. You're being matured. You're being postured. You're being prepared for the moment when Yah orchestrates the, the circumstances. When your family comes to you and say, you know, I've been watching your life. And hearing the things that you've been saying, and I'm interested in what you're teaching and how you're living. And Yah opens up that door, and you're able to assist. You're able to bring about a great deliverance, and you're able to bring about a great salvation. I want to encourage you, continue to believe. We see it all through the Bible. There is a promise for those of us who are within the will of Elohim. There is a promise from him of household salvation. Hallelujah.